This is the Nomad Futurist Podcast, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and transformation. Connect with us, share your thoughts with us at nomadfuturist.com. Let's get this started. Here are Phil and Nabil. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Nomad Futurist. This is your co-host Nabil Mahmood, live from Austin, Texas at Data Center World. This is your co-host Philip Koblenz, live in Austin at Data Center World. And this is the guest, Ray Parpart, live from Austin, like a, sitting between these two A guests. human being. I can't believe it. You're 3D. You exist. And no mask. That's uh, even better. Uh, <laughs> I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, and I'm all positive. So I'm uh, all right. Uh, wonderful. Thank goodness. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come out here and meet with us in person. Let's uh, get to know you a little bit more on a personal basis. So tell us a little about what do you do? So I'm currently the director of data center operations and strategy at the University of Chicago, um, and I wear many hats. I've got service desk, a mainframe, our operations center, and a whole bunch of stuff for the data centers. And so we're responsible for many different pieces at the at the University of Chicago. So how big is your data center? So I have a number of spaces, but I've got 14,000 square feet, three and a half megawatt of uh, mission critical space. So basically your customer base is your students. The faculty and staff. So my spaces predominantly support just campus and research faculty and staff. Now we do have other supercomputers. More of our data center now is shifting more to supercompute versus administrative compute, which is getting small, going to SAS, going to cloud. But we support the original project Moonshot, our current president Biden. Right. His research. Cancer cluster, research. Right. His cancer research that clusters to my data center, which is part of the genomics data commons. We've got another giant supercomputer that keeps growing. It's called the Midway. It's part of our campus research compute. And that serves 900 some researchers any given time and provides access to people on and off campus, researchers on and off campus. So Ray, that's phenomenal work, right? It's really exciting. We'll get into the innovation stuff and what you do, maybe a little bit further the conversation. We always ask this question about how did you get into this space? Do you want to be a data center guy when you grew up, right? <laughs> so I got into IT totally by accident. We haven't had, you haven't heard this story. I so have not. My degree is in film and television, and I was doing theater and the concert tours back in the 80s, doing lighting and sound. And the girl I was dating that I met in high school, we decided we wanted to get married. And so I'd like, I got to get off the road. And she's like, hey, we've got an opening in the mailroom. Why don't you come apply? So I went and applied for a job in the mailroom. And in college, I learned computers made my life easier because I could type papers on a computer. I can't spell, but I could type. And that was before spell check. Before spell check, yeah. Actually, no. Kids, kids, there was a time before spell check. Well, they don't even need to worry about grammar anymore. <laughs> They've got Grammarly. Right? <laughs> Grammarly. Founded in the Ukraine, by the way. There you go. Did not know that. See that? See, we learn a lot on the yeah. So anyway, I applied for the mailroom and put on my resume and all this stuff. And the lady's like, hey, I see you applied for the mailroom. And I was like, yeah, I just want my job. And she's like, but you have all this computer experience. I said, yeah, I learned computers made my life easy. She says, well, we've got this programming job. I said, does it pay more? She's like, yeah. I said, I'll take it. And I haven't looked back. Well, that's wonderful. So there was a girl involved in it. it was As a, there, there was a girl. There's always one. And, and she still were, is. We're still married. Wonderful. Congratulations. 32 years and two days. Outstanding. And she's the doctor. She's a doctor. She's a doctor. Lovely. Okay. And then the mailroom. And then the mailroom. Mail so, right. right. Started the ground up. <laughs> the, that was General Motors? No, that was Aon, actually. Aon. That, it was, oh, the, it was the before insurance. Aon was Aon when it was a bunch of subsidiaries. And I worked for one of the subsidiaries. And... So the path went from programming in DBase 3 plus. In fact, the, my first job was doing a Y2K compliant job in the mid nineties. So you're the reason it never came to be. That's you saw that. That's right. right. We goodness. all talk about Y2K. Why? Because back in 98 and earlier, sorry, back in 94, we were all doing Y2K compliant mitigations. So that was my first job. Guy wrote a program and it was written with hard coded three years of dates. And my job is go through and Y2K compliant the whole thing. <laughs> so, and then I just, from a technology perspective, I've always managed to latch on to whatever the next thing was. My career has been very fortunate in that Novell networking came about and I got into Novell networking and then I got into wide area networking. I got into data centers. And so my career, I've been very blessed with being one step ahead of the next curve. And I'm a little slow right now because with the cloud, I'm way behind in the cloud. So let's step back. How, how did you keep up with all of that? Was, was the change not fast enough as it is today? Were you 
thinking, processing data, information differently at a younger age. Not saying that we are old, but clearly, back to the matter, clearly, it's, you well, slow down, right? My God. Slow down. Like, uh, a colleague laughs at me because I refer myself as a middle aged, balding, fat guy. Yeah, it's better than what Amy Marcus said over here before. Uh, it's true. Stale male and pale. <laughs> I'm going to have to borrow that. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm a hungry learner. My wife even says that about me. I'm hungry. I want to know. And so I'm very, very, I'm not complacent about wanting to learn something new. And so when I come to shows like this here at AFCOM Data Center World, I'll stop and talk to every one of the vendors because I want to learn. I want to know when I've got electricians in or network people in and something that they're doing that I don't know about, I'm going to ask them lots of questions and sit back on the outside just far enough to watch and to learn what they're doing and build a strong relationship with them. So when I have a question, I have a problem or I hit a, a roadblock, I now have a resource to go to will then educate me. And I try to pass that on. But my biggest concern, I think to your, to answer your question is I'm hungry. I want to learn endless. How many, how many times do you actually, so you come to a show like this and you find out like what the latest technologies are, what the latest phrases for cooling, for power. And in, in a data center environment, particularly one that is, I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of an enterprise environment because, you know, you have customers, but they're all internal. Can you implement those changes fairly readily? It's, it's sometimes it's difficult to, you know, change things within a data center environment, an environment, but do you find yourself able to implement those? Yeah. One of the nice things about the universities were fairly dynamic. Like most data centers, you've got design criteria that you got to live around. And so how do you mitigate around those or work around those? So things were, but see, my data centers are really different. So I've got spaces that have pr traditional crack units all the way up to rear door heat exchangers, in-row cooling units, refrigerant-based pumped in-row cooling. So I've got a very like big matter. It should be in your data center. It, so it gets the all of it in it's <laughs> action. I tell people all the time, if you want to see the world of cooling or racks or power, because we're doing all kinds of crazy things with power, I'm like, come see me. I got all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, we might have to set a visit. Yeah. It'd we'll be have, fun. It'll let's entertain first, you. First on-site uh, on thing. Is that is it difficult to manage multiple sets of infrastructure within one environment? It's It hasn't been because we've taken the time to try to build them right. And we maintain, we have a we have a very big maintenance program. One of the nice things the university is they leave me alone because they trust me to do my job. And well, you know where all the bodies are buried. I do because I built the space. <laughs> <laughs> and I know where all the blind spots are for the security cameras. You I hear me in Chicago? <laughs> Don't piss off oh, Ray. He knows everything. So no, we are able to, if I see something new that's that's very innovative and very interesting and will help us you know, with our customers and our clients in cooling or power efficiency. No, we're absolutely pretty quickly can and can implement it. As a kid growing up or even when you went through mailroom, was that even something that you were curious about, interested in to be part of? Computers or? Technology and data centers. I kind of in high school thought I wanted to be a computer programmer until I went to college and took my first Fortran class and said, no way. Because we did programming basic and some of those, some of those back in the day. We actually had computers at high school, <laughs> eight inch floppies. And but you know, what's computers. amazing about it is, so you did start in, in, in the programming world once you got back into the computers, but now you're kind of out, out of that programming right. world in the facilities world, right? Yes. So do you, do you, had, was that like a natural transition? Like I, I'm sure when you, when you went from the mailroom to programming, you were like, I just want to get to air conditioning one day. One day I just want to be. No, it, it, it came out and I was never, I never worked in the mailroom. They said, well. We'll just hire as a programmer. So the, the, the mail room was the door into the, right. ant, into ant. no, it was one thing led to another. I went to, we did the D-based programming. I took over, we built the first Novell network, got rid of all the valence and twin X cable. And uh, I built, like I said, I built that Novell network, worked for them. I went into consulting, I had a buddy who was in consulting, brought me over. I did that for two years and got a job offer with General Motors. And when I went to General Motors, I. I managed infrastructure for them because I had started getting into networking. And so I was doing networking consulting with the General Motors as a network guy. The network guy led into management. I wound up becoming in more of a manager because GM at that point was a, a pure, and they, well, they were a pure outsource environment, but I was a badge GM employee and my job was to manage all the infrastructure outsourcers. Mm -hmm. So now that got me into leadership, a, a nice big push, push into leadership. And it was just... Part of that was, well, I have all the servers. I manage the network team and the servers team. Well, they're in the data center. Well, there's a problem with the data center. Well, I'll go fix that. And so that turned into, we're going to colo for our SAP. Hey, Ray, go figure out this data center stuff. Sure. I'm <laughs> trip to Toronto. I'm in. 
And so it's just it, every, every step has been, what's that next thing? And when I went to, I left General Motors and went to the University of Chicago, I, again, I managed the server teams and transferred from the business school. They had an opening at central IT or enterprise IT. We don't like to call it central IT. We still have a good name. And I was able to transfer over there. And that was, hey, come run the Windows team, the VM team, and the data center in the mainframe operations team. And like, sure, this is fun. And that just keeps evolving to, as in any company, as you move through the company, you pick up groups, you lose groups. And I, I've always had the data centers at the U Chicago. We've built three, four spaces, uh, small spaces, they're all small, um, 2,000, 4,000, but 500 kW here, 500 kW here, 2.5 meg there. Got a seven meg space design that someday I hope I get to build. So it's just as I navigate my career, I'm the guy that wants to fix the problem. It's kind of what I do. What did you find uh, different from, I guess, GM would be considered corporate world to you know, the world of education? Wow. So the, the education world is a very difficult world to be in. It's very challenging for somebody who comes from a very, from corporate. In a corporate world, you can get a decision. I can go ask somebody, here's my problem. Here's my recommendation. Yes or no. And you're going to get yes, no, or option B. You know, my CIO says, nope, we're going to go that way. I'm in. But at that point, we're in, we're going. Right. I had, it doesn't matter. I had a colleague when I first started, pull me aside and say, you need to know something about university life. If you're in a meeting and you take a vote and the outcome is 25 to one, it depends who that one person <laughs> is, whether they win or lose. <laughs> so the challenges in higher ed is patience. We don't move fast. We do some amazing things. I work with at the University of Chicago, you know, I, we talk about all the Big Ten schools that we're still a part of. And I joke with my Big Ten colleagues, they laugh at it because we always bring it up, is they all have their bowl games to show off at how many trophies they've got. And I'm like, well, we got the first Heisman, so I got you there. And I got 100, Bell, 100 Nobel laureates. And so I'll take my 100 Nobel laureates to your, uh, I'm not sure which is better. <laughs> so, but the academic world is, it's patience in a lot of buy-in and, and making sure we were talking before this is I need to be a partner with somebody or a support person with somebody and make sure they don't see me as an impediment. Right. And that's, you know, what I say on the podcast all the time is that, and I said this earlier to you, 99% of what I do is psychology and 1% is like, you know, actually doing the stuff that we get paid to do. And it's not like, imagine this got paid 99. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is why, this is why the psychologists are, are this is why at least they're doing the thing. They're getting compensated <laughs> for the thing that is <laughs> totally, totally, totally sounds like billions. Actually, right. right. The exactly. psychologists. <laughs> no, 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 no question about it. But it sounds like you feel the, uh, the same way in terms of, you know, having to essentially convince everyone that you're on their side. Yeah. And it's like, it's so often in anything that we do is if you tell somebody they should do something as Americans, we're going the other direction. Right. And what you learn in business is you always have two options. You never give anybody one option. You give them two because they'll pick one and hopefully you can sell it. So they'll pick the right one. And in higher ed, most of those people, sorry, let me back up. All the people I work with are much smarter than I could ever dream of being. And how these people are really smart about computers and about what they want and how they want it to accomplish. So most of the time they know more about the technology than I could ever dream of. So I have to make sure you, you'll never snowball any of them. So it's just being straight, open and honest, but in a way that is, I'm the good guy and I want to help you and tell me how to make you successful. My goal is to be here to solve your problems, to help you be successful. So you can focus on, on the thing that you're right, supposed yeah. to be doing, yeah. which is probably not. But that's true. It's, yeah. So I think the core lesson out of that is communication. Absolutely. Yeah. And being Absolutely. transparent. Yeah. I work with, I run a service desk at the university. One of the things we've, we're constantly drilling, we've been coaching and mentoring is communication, open, transparent, clear communication. Simply tell me what's going on. We're good. Like I used to tell my kids, if you tell me the truth, you may get disciplined, but you'll never get in trouble. Yep. And, and I think that applies in everything we do. Yeah. That applies in life. Yeah. Own it. Yeah. Own it. Own it. That is the <laughs> name of the, uh, the title. Exactly. The title. Own it. Own it. <laughs> I was going to say, suggest the title be, wow. Funny. All right. So tell, tell us something personal, sports, music, anything. 
Claw. Well, so if anybody's here at Data Center Dynamics and put Claw and pulls up my <laughs> profile, you'll see a very interesting picture. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll have to go look. Now you're going to build, uh, you're going to be an influencer by the end of this. Everyone's going to be like, oh, I, wanna, I, wanna, I have to go check out this profile. What is on this profile? So, no, I, I remodel my house for fun. And when I'm done remodeling, it means it's time to buy a new house. And so I met my wife in high school doing theater and did theater as an amateur. We still do theater occasionally, not near as much because it's just time consuming and I'm getting old and it's hard to memorize songs and lines. But so no, look, my wife and I, my lovely bride have been, to, and even with our kids, my. Like the Partridge family. Yeah, pretty much. So my kids are big cosplayers right now. And so my really? bride and I follow them all over the, all over doing cosplay events and. Like all the, uh, like all the, the second city is, is in Chicago, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, so uh, maybe this will be live from New York at Saturday night. Maybe one of the, <laughs> one of the airports, one of the younger ones <laughs> will, will eventually grace the, uh, the stage in studio 8H. Exactly. Yeah. So we would love to hear something. The, the audio levels go a little high because I have a very loud mouth and my voice carries. So <laughs> we'll just stick with, wow. Yeah, wow. All right. How about the claw? Is there a story? That you want oh, to the claw. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got a fight with a snowblower and it won. And I tell people I was evaluating the warning symbols on the snowblowers and they mean something. You should follow the direction. <laughs> and so now I crushed my hand in a snowblower um, 20 some years ago and fortunately didn't lose my fingers, but um, very limited. I can still type. I can't play the piano, but never could. But I can type and they still work. So And it's a really cool party trick. If you ever see Ray Hyde um, and about... Just to try to get him to punch you in the face with his with his left hand. Really good slapper. I can't really, but can't, can't kind of, <laughs> they're laughing at me because I'm trying it's to make crazy. a face. It's crazy. Like, Am I not supposed to laugh? This, 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 this demands that you actually move the production to video. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everyone reach out to Ray on LinkedIn to check out this picture. It's on LinkedIn. Is that the uh, no, it's not on LinkedIn. It's, on, it's only on the, the data center. So you have to be part of the data center um, world. World. Oh, for this, oh my God. The, this the data center 2022. Really? Well, we, we <laughs> might have to talk Ray into actually making a special appearance <laughs> with this photograph in right. my future. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll come in costume. There you go. All right. So uh, some key lessons that you can share with our audience uh, that uh, made you successful and helped you. You could tell, here. talk to the, it sounds, it sounds like you don't need to talk to the younger Ray because Ray was smart enough to be curious and, and unafraid. But if you could talk to the younger generation and say, this is what I've learned in all my years that will help you be successful. Yeah. I, it, I had no, it, a lot of these things that I talk about, you know, and I, you didn't learn until I was in my early fifties, I'm getting old, but I left, you know, people ask why I left GM. I loved you. It was the best job I ever had in my career. And to this day, it's still the best job. We you hear that you Chicago HR. Ah, I love you. Up your game. Uh, I've even, I, think that I love that job. It was a great company. We did amazing things. And I left because I was dumb and arrogant. You know, I just, I made mistakes. I thought I knew I had the world by its tail and I thought I was all that. I had good leadership who kind of crowded me a little bit, but I really never listened. It wasn't until I got to, to University of Chicago that I had a mentor sit me down one day and really have a good conversation. It stuck. I had a, I want to tell a couple of stories real quick to get to your answer is I had a, one of my managers, I asked him why to do something. He didn't do it. And I asked him why he didn't do it. And he said, because you're just going to change it anyway. And it was a cold slap in the face. I literally stopped cold in my traps when it happened. I turned around and looked at him. And I said, thanks for the feedback. I'll never do that again. And I didn't. But it wasn't until later in my career where I finally started to hear those things. We, we or listen to all, we, we hear it, but are you really listening? And so some of those things that I've done is if I ask for a decision, I take your, I have to take your answer. I have to give you the time to listen. Don't be the smartest guy in the room, even if you think you are, because if you are, then take the time to mentor those around you and to draw them into the conversation, to draw them into the solution. Let them think, help them think, but let them think. Don't stand up and always be that guy. And for years I was, and I finally, and I still fought, I'm still guilty of doing that. And, but try, I try to step back and really let others around me have a voice. And some of the hardest things to do is to stop talking and let someone else talk first. And I've learned to do that with my leadership team. So that was the best advice I ever got was that you have two ears and one mouth. I right. like it. Yeah. <laughs> My dad used to say, engage your brain before you engage your mouth. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Where's the live by? The industry is evolving. It's just changing dramatically. It's changing very rapidly. Yeah. 
we talked briefly about it earlier, this constant evolution and change and, and, and it's sort of like slowed down a little bit. How do you keep up with this evolution and, and constant change? Ironically, a lot of these shows, there are more, you know, there are, are many more data center worlds in by 24, AFCOM, and the list goes on and on. A lot of trade drags that are now digital. I talk a lot of, to a lot of my engineers and architects because they're going to see it from an electromechanical point. Because my job really now is facility. I'm a facilities guy. Right. Um, I just have to make sure the power cooling zone. But we talk about efficiencies and sustainability. The theme of the show here is where am I going to learn that? And so it's talking to every one of these vendors down here on the floor, taking the time to meet with them and learn. I don't answer the phone a lot. I tell people, if you ever need to get a hold of me, call me, leave me a voicemail because I'm not answering the phone if I don't recognize your number. But it, at the end of the day, it's really, you have to want to go learn and go out and visit with others. And so we tour data centers. We're part of the Big Ten still. Um, we're part of the IE Plus schools. And all of us get together on a very regular basis. And some of the greatest knowledge I've gained in the last couple of years is peering with the my Big Ten colleagues, because we're all about the same size as what we're doing data center wise. I mean, student wise are significantly larger, but from a computational perspective, we're all in the same boat. I guess that's one thing that from uh, from a school perspective, you know, you can have that camaraderie because you're not right. really competing, right? In the same way that data center companies aren't going to want the other company to right. get their, you know, trade secrets. You guys would want to, you know, share that that stuff. How much, you know, when we had, you know, the pandemic started, what, March 2020, and it was obviously difficult, if not impossible, to find shows like this that come to in person. Did you see a huge fall off in your ability to kind of absorb some of the the, the stuff, you know, through the virtual forums? Is it much better in person to, to, to have that engagement? The, the virtual forums were a good bridge um, because we had spent, we'd never done it. So even though the virtual, we all got teamed out or zoomed out or online out, but it's for some point it was new. It was shiny. It was new. Right. Hey, I could talk to anybody anywhere in the world and attend this well, webinar. And it's all using a data center somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> there is no cloud. It's someone else's data center. Yeah. It, it was the opportunity to participate in those and to read some of the, the papers that are coming out. And a lot of the groups did webinars, which I thought were very, very helpful. And I also learned that a lot of people now are also doing monthly webinars. Here's a 30 minute monthly update about our product or about our company or, or the new thing that we've invented. No, I'm a, I'm a social butterfly. I'm a face-to-face -face guy. We that's why, you know, we've sat on some sessions before and I've been very honored to participate with you guys, but it's really about hand to hand in your face, talking, touching, seeing we miss. I do like, I, in my, my team laugh at me sometimes because I'll go days in a, a day of work and I get anything done because we're working, I'm working the room at work. <laughs> oh, that, that, that is work. I mean, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. John they, Chambers used to do that with Cisco. I know absolutely. it's an old story. He pushed an ice, ice cream cart around and said, you know, you get ice cream, but you got to tell me something. Right. Help me make my company better. And he'd give you, give you an ice cream. Yeah. So, you, know, you know, it's, it's fun times. It's great times to be a part of the whole technology yeah. and the evolution and, and live in the digital space and the data rush. But the human element and the human intelligence and the interaction can never no, you disappear. We, we have, we, we, this is our DNA. We can't really change that. AI is going to get us to do a lot of the, the mundane things, those repetitive things that, hey, I see something going, predictive analytics, which are going to help us do our jobs better. The key is we have to be able to adopt those. It's going to also help you focus on your true passion, which is social butterfly. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Social exactly. butterfly. That's going to be my new model. Yeah, especially for Arnold and Claudeville. So, you know, being out here today and, you know, you attending a few of the shows, well, what are some of the core things that you're looking at as far as the, the future of computing and data centers are concerned? So it, as a data center manager, everything we're doing is power cooling. And how are you going to get the most efficiencies? We're driving densities up. And you're now seeing those densities for a long, long time. We talk, talk to all the colo providers out here. They're like, eh, 4KW is all I'm seeing. Yeah. And, you know, NVIDIA is releasing chips, Intel, AMD. They're all going... They're being kind of secretive right now, but we're all looking at- Because they can't actually deliver any of them. Well, they will. And, uh, <laughs> eventually. <it's weird. laughs> eventually. You know good and well this stuff is coming and yeah. we're not prepared for it. You know, we're doing 25, 35 KW cabinets today. We're struggling with air management side of those cabinets. And so what do I see is I see those densities going up and they are actually going up. And so how are we going to be ready for toilet cabinets? No, <laughs> no, I think is, you know, as we become experts in our field, again, we're evolving. I'm becoming a thermodynamic person and a fluid dynamic person trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Mm -hmm. 
well, from an air management. And so CFD modeling is something I'm, ha I'm having to learn simply to make the systems work. I think some of the decent tools, this with other stuff, we need to get, I've said for years, one of the things we need to get to is where we're finally getting to is I want information. I don't want data. We collect data. Johnson Controls, Siemens, Delta, our building automation system. Oh my goodness, we're collecting stuff every 30 seconds and I've got 15 years of data. I don't need the data. I want, I need the information that that data is telling me. And so as we look at our DC you need system, interpretation. I do. And so, you know, even, even all the tools that are out there, we're now trying to integrate all of it. DSIMs and cable management and ticketing systems. And, you know, how do I finally get to the ecosystem where I can let the AI drive me to help me make decisions, but to get back to doing what I do best. And that is solving the problem, working with my team to solve the problem. Yes. Well, or chit chat with them about. Yeah. Social media. Um, look, I think, I think one thing, one point that the audience to take away from this is as a you know, data center manager, I don't even know what the titles are anymore. You know, head bottle washer, you, right? Head bottle washer, the chief janitor. I think, I think it, what's lost in some of that is how complex the data center is. If you yeah. went to someone and they asked what you did and you said data center engineer, they're like, oh, what does that mean? It means oh, I take care of where the computers are. You know, it just sounds mundane. But if you actually told them that you are a thermodynamics engineer, you are yeah. part mechanical engineer, part, you know, to a certain extent, chemical engineer, part, you know, all electrical. these different electrical engineer, yeah, first, all, all these different disciplines mm -hmm. without the accolades that come with that in, in a title, I think people would be really drawn to our space because those have some real gravitas and you, I know you don't want to be the smartest person in the room, but you are the smartest person about so many different things. Yeah. Whereas the smartest person in the room tends to be smart about, I'm, I'm referencing Dennis Hamza podcast, right? Is smart about just like a, a fairly narrow amount of data. So you'll always be the smartest person in the room to me, right? Oh, you're so calm. It's okay. <laughs> well, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time and doing this in person. This was a lot more fun in person versus uh, doing it virtually. I'm no sure question. No question. question. And, and I'd have confirmation that you're wearing pants. So that, yeah, there you go. That's true. And a nice shirt. And a nice shirt. Well, and I got to see the claw. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, could you leave like one core message for the young generation and people in transition that uh, potentially might be looking to get into our space? Yeah, I think it, it's it's more than just getting in the space. It's about what you're doing in the future. And it's and as I'm hiring new people, I tell them, look, show up, do your job, but be hungry. I want you to be, you need to be hungry. Be willing to learn. Don't get stuck in one thing or two things. You know, hey, I'm a computer programmer. Yay. But be hungry in what you learn and be willing to listen to that guy person next to you, in front of you, and soak up what they're telling you. And I think those are some of the, and the third thing is be, be transparent, be open. We use, we throw transparent around a lot, but at the end of the day, you really just need to, you need to own it. Be honest. If you don't know it, it's okay. If you know it, share it. Teach it. Thank you very much again. And then did one thing I would be remiss, remiss if I didn't tell everybody here that Ray Parpar is a Nomad Futurist podcast super fan. I am. So thank you. Thank you for your fandom. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of it. Thanks. <laughs> this has been great. Nothing lasts forever. Markets will come back. Currencies will rebound. Businesses will go on and we'll all move on. That could happen next week, next month, or next year. I'm confident that those who prepare rather than panic will come out of this stronger. Thank you for joining us. This has been brought to you by Nomad Futurist. Check us online at nomadfuturist.com.